All right, off we go. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this North America focused edition of our GWO expert series webinars on digitalization and training. I'm Ralph Savage, Head of Communication, and in this series, we bring you together with our members for a look at what the future could hold as digital solutions become a more common part of the GWO training mix. Up on screen, we have our first audience panel question. Uh, we want you to be a part of the debate today as well. So please take a moment to log on to menti.com and type in the code you see on screen, 524563. Your contribution appears live and it gives us plenty of food for thought. Um, while those results begin to form on screen, there's a few that have come in very much in favour of one option. And um, we asked this question in a previous webinar. Um, Jakob Holst um, is with us today, Jakob, CEO of Global Wind Organisation. Um, what do you think about what we're seeing um, so far? Obviously, it's early days, but um, uh, last time around we had a sort of 50 50 split between customers deciding on and the first option yes. on the left. Yes, I think, we, and we have much, much more respondents to the last one, but it, it certainly encouraged the adoption of GWO was one of the answers, and then the, uh, the other half was on the customer will decide that um, digitalization will bring so much options for customization and personalization of training that this will be a, a requirement from the customer uh, going forward. So interesting. Let's see when we get to the end of this. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see if one or two more uh, responses come through. Um, just in time, don't let people feel uh, left out. Um, a little bit more in favor of the customer there. Um, we'll come to a lot of these topics in the panel discussion, um, but um, just as a quick sort of scene sector as well, we understand that DWO obviously isn't, um, hasn't penetrated the new market in the Mexico in the way that it has in Europe. So, uh, you'll have to forgive us for um, launching you in case for a topic perhaps, um, you know, a little bit um, uh, the, the, the this has been a couple of years, and right now is to is to it's in North America. In the um, nevertheless, probably through the course of this webinar, understand such a, a key issue um, for our members and, and also for training providers who work around and so on. So, thanks again for playing your part in that first little bit of feedback. We will um, provide uh, the grants afterwards uh, as part of a package that we can email over to you. Um, we'll have a few more opportunities like this uh, during the webinar as well, but for now, I'd like to introduce our panel for today. First guest, guest is uh, Wesley Witt, recently elected chair of the GWO North America Committee. Wes has been with Siemens Gamesa since 2015 and is responsible for policy management at the HSE across the Americas. Uh, Simon Hayes is also a recent addition to North America, picking up the role of uh, time at this. Uh, he's been with Arsenal for seven years, building extensive leadership experience in offshore. He studied marine engineering at Rillo Technical College in the UK. Uh, next up is Dan Ortega of Vestas, an experienced operations and training manager in the renewable and nuclear energy industries. Dan is skilled in operations and maintenance management, scheduling and coordinating resources and continuing improvement. Taylor Burnett is Assistant Superintendent of Business and Industry Services at one of the largest PWO providers in North America. Pipelines Technology Center in Woodward, Oklahoma, was a pioneer in the US for GWO, becoming certified in 2015 and now training over 3,000 students across its renewable wind energy activation programs. And finally, from our team here, we've already introduced you, Jakob. Jakob has been with GWO since it was in 2015, following a long career in Denmark before that has been approved. Welcome to all of you guys. 
So on to our agenda for today, we we'll begin by spending a little time about why we're all here. Uh, why are we asking about digitalization and training? I, I mentioned it wrong. Then we'll cover some of the development in 2020. After this, we'll review the lessons learned so far this year. If you didn't join us before, this is a special edition in which we'll tackle all of the issues from what was a three part series into today's one hour. So will bring us to around the 15 minute mark, and then we'll begin the panel discussion and hear from our guests. If you've got any questions for us in the meantime, please don't hesitate. Just write them into the question box on your browser or your phone, and we'll get to the time. It's been a very challenging year for us all. I think that goes without saying. So, firstly, we'll turn to uh, you, Jakob, to explain why digitalization has risen so quickly to the top of the industry agenda in 2020. Thank you, Ralph. So even before the pandemic, our 2022 strategy was called Safety Without Borders, and it contained an ambition to facilitate much greater use of digital tools in training and in auditing. So we released the strategy on March 11 in the morning, and a central target of the strategy is to double the trained workforce by 2022, and you can see some of the numbers on screen. In the afternoon, same afternoon of the March 11, the global pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization and the world went into lockdown. And in the following several weeks, more than a thousand technicians lapsed their refresher training every week. So it's safe to say that the need for digital solutions was seriously fast tracked by COVID-19. On the screen are the four things that um, the GWO team brought to the market in April. Uh, this was uh, several months and even years in advance of our schedule. We fast-tracked a lot of things, but these are the four most important ones uh, for now. We've been gone evaluating this work and what we learned today with you in this webinar series will feed back into our strategy session that we have next week on the 29th of September. So first of all, we fast-tracked our work on the requirements for training providers and for certification bodies to describe what we at GWO see as relevant use of digital tools. This was informed by the training committee and by the audit compliance committee. So for training providers, we now allow them to be certified to deliver blended solutions for all training standards. And as a tangible result, before April, we had one training provider delivering a blended learning package. And now here in early September, late September, Less than five months uh, later, we have actually, it says 36, the real number is uh, 41 training providers, or roughly uh, 12, 13% of the training provider community certified to deliver one or several GWO standards using digital tools in a blended learning solution. So the community is responding really rapidly to crisis and to new opportunity, and that's that's great to see. So in this, this uh, uh, graph, uh, shows a little bit about how rapidly the world has been changing. The red line is what we expected of uh, records uploads into our window database in 2020. The blue line was what happened in 2019. And then the orange line is what happened in 2020. So we started out better than the red line and it dropped dramatically into April where we had uh, a significant lockdown and almost no training providers were allowed or able to deliver training. In these months, it was Poland and Taiwan who were holding, that were keeping the torch, but that was it. And we then did some, um, uh, some projections into the future to see how fast uh, we would bounce back. And that has exceeded our expectations. That's the orange line going from April and up. And what I should say that it dips a little bit. Uh, now in August, that is possibly due to a little bit of late uh, action on the part of training providers uploading records. But um, this, is the, this, is how, uh, um, uh, this is how it looks. And part of this fast recovery can be attributed to digital blended learning solutions or to BSTR partial from the 36 or actually for the 41 training providers. Another part of this uh, recovery has been facilitated by remote auditing uh, that we now allow for annual surveillance and for recertification. So keeping training providers in business. Thanks. Thanks, Jakob. So before we bring our panel into the day's proceedings, we want to remind you about what we've learned so far in this series. 
Uh, we've held three episodes covering the topics you see on screen. Audience-wise, we've had more than 200 participants from 29 countries online. And I'll remind you, as Robert said, that we're putting the lessons learned directly into our member strategy session agenda next week. Uh, in episode one, we discussed the topic of maintaining quality of learning in a digital environment. Uh, looking at the potential benefits, our panel said that digitalization could support a more personalized learning experience while enabling a more flexible program, particularly if their employees have operational commitments to fulfill. Uh, another interesting point was raised about inclusivity. Uh, we presented a case study from MHI Vestas and their safety in mind mobile application, which is part of a blended learning solution for the basic safety training refresher. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I've just put a few screenshots of the app up on screen. Uh, with this case study, we discovered that digital solutions like this can help training providers, for example, assess the differing skill levels of participants at the beginning of the course, helping to guide their learning and not putting everybody in the same box. In uh, episode two, the middle column, we focused largely on remote audits, which was the final point that Jakob mentioned in developments this year. Um, certification bodies are adapting to the practice so they can observe learning as it happens and certify a training provider while not physically being in the classroom or at the training center. Our panel had a lot to say on the ways this could be overcome, but we were also grateful for some other suggestions they made. Um, as we all know, digital delivery means different things to different people, and our panel suggested that we at GWO should focus our efforts on making the standards even simpler so everyone can understand the content and implement them correctly. The message was very clear. The business environment is transforming, not least by the continuing global pandemic. They said the training providers who want to introduce digital elements the requirements should guide auditors and ensure that the learning objective is achieved without compromising quality of training. In the final episode last week, we were joined by uh, Vestas, uh, Siemens Gourmetser, RW Renewables and the China Wind Energy Association. As um, Jakob mentioned earlier, DWO men uh, members want to see 200,000 people trained to the standard by the end of 2022. At the moment, we're around half that. Um, so we looked at how digitalization could help or hinder the adoption of standards in large markets like China, India, and today the US. Um, generally, the panel agreed digitalization would help the standards grow, not least because as employers, they would probably use it if it's available and provides the required quality. They also acknowledged that it could, in some cases, raise barriers for those training providers without an established way of training virtually, but agreed with the previous suggestion uh, that if we further simplify what GWO standards require, we can help the majority move in this direction. So with all that in mind, we uh, want to ask you our second question of the day. So please, if you have a moment, take to uh, visit menti.com and type in the code on screen. Um, please, panelists also, uh, you're welcome to do this too. Uh, the code is 642822. Eight, and I'll switch to that screen so you can see it while it's happening. <clears throat> this question is all about benefits. Um, when we first looked at digitalization, um, we thought it would all be about cost, but it, it doesn't seem as clear cut anymore. So tell us what you think from this collection of five and Wes, if you've been typing away as well, uh, I'd like to bring you into the discussion on this first series you were recently elected to lead the North America Committee, the, the panels before have lent towards flexibility as, as their key benefit on this list. What, what do you think? Where are you coming at this from? From, from my perspective, that was the, the first thing I wrote down was flexibility. Uh, I think it's key for the U.S. market. Uh, we're used to having uh, flexible training options, and, and that's from all industries, not just the wind industry. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, suppliers in the market. And the main thing is flexibility and the quality of the training and the ability to, uh, I think the cost savings comes in second after that, because I think in our market, we're, we, we're currently in a, in a situation with, with a lot of price erosion in the market. We understand that uh, amongst uh, whether you're a, a, an operator or if you are in an OEM position, whichever. So we have to address the, the elephant in the room. We have to make sure they have quality training at a good price. And I think 
anybody who's in, in training or in the safety uh, side of the business quickly understands that something off the shelf that helps us and is a benefit, uh, we're going to take that option. And so I think uh, when, when we take a look at the digital uh, platform here, this is has really been forced our hand because of COVID-19 to understand that we can do these things. Uh, I think it's really put us in a position to, to be able to show the benefits of, of digital delivery. It's effective and the, the benefits reduced weight, uh, days away from the farms, I think is another benefit that really helps out a lot because the ability to keep techs at the sites and with that in conjunction with COVID-19, we're going to continue to reduce the risk of having people travel to different places and potentially bring back COVID-19 to the sites. So I think this is a real driver for the industry and it's in the right direction. And, and it falls in line also with what we're doing in education. When you look at uh, university education has gone a lot online as well. So we're just falling right in line with the rest of the education providers in the country. Mm. Um, I'm gonna turn to one of the other panelists, Dan Ortega from Vestas. I saw you nodding away in, in agreement, but um, could you just point out which, which of these five is um, yeah, I definitely agree with what Les was saying. I actually put cost in there as well because, you know, with um, transition to GWO, I mean, that's one of the big uh, pieces that we're analyzing is the cost benefit analysis, especially when sometimes the, the standard increases the duration of training compared to some of the traditional U.S. training. Um, and so having that flexible delivery model, the blended model, um, and exploiting some of the time the technician has at their site before they have to do face-to-face -face training definitely helps the helps the business case analysis um, and gives you know the sites a lot more um, opportunity to pursue that training when it makes sense to them. Thanks, Dan. And just to stick to this point, Taylor, um, your first uh, representative of this series that we've had from a training provider, actually. So it'll be interesting to know what your perspective is on this. Well, like uh, Jakob said earlier, you know, COVID is in West, COVID has forced everybody to put the metal, pedal to the metal right now and change. As an educational institute and a training provider, this is something we've been talking about forever. It's just the implementation of the hands-on and the benefits with that. And I think that probably the more efficient, and I guarantee you when it comes down to the, these companies, like as Wes alluded to, is reducing that cost and time to allowing them to take it on their own time and then possibly come in for the practical side of things because you can't lose that hands-on approach. Thanks very much, guys. So we're going to turn to the main presentation. So just a moment. Okay, so um, up on screen is, is sort of a taster question, actually, um, which I'm going to begin uh, by asking you, Simon. Um, how do you describe effective training, and can we transfer this into a digital set of people making quality? Thanks, Ralph. I, th I think for me, effective training is is something that is easily absorbed. Um, it's obviously going to be related to the training and relevant to the industry, but more importantly, from my perspective in the offshore, it's the environment that people are going to experience. So try to ensure that this, this training is absorbed in some way, uh, but gives them an appreciation of the environment they're going to be working in. Um, it's, it's very difficult. And historically, the trainer for me has been a, a significant role player here to give the, the audience that engagement, making sure that there's acknowledgement of that training. Moving to a, a virtual setting is, is the challenge for me. It's how do, we, how do we keep that engagement? How do we keep the acknowledgement of training? Um, we wanna make sure that that virtual training is a professional experience. So the technology doesn't detract away from the messaging. Um, so I think it, it's a very difficult topic to try and put into one specific box. But I, I think if we can keep the engagement, the acknowledgement, but also understand where that trainee is at that particular time, I think we'll have a good chance of delivering a virtual platform. Mm. The same question to you, Wes. So to me, effective training really is divine, defined by observable competence or applied knowledge. And so whatever medium that we use to, to deliver training, whether it's online or if it's in classroom, 
we can observe that that competence in in the application like uh when we actually are performing the audits or we're actually engaging in in the in the in-person portion of the training universities have been doing this for quite some time uh online training is nothing new and then there's different mediums to to deliver the content to to hit different types of learners and we just have to piggyback off of what's actually already out there and continue to um, drive quality training but seeing the confidence that's the key for me is is being able to identify that whatever delivery method we use whether it's in person or if it's an online training that the complete the, the learning loop that we identified that the folks actually can apply the knowledge and dan i'll, I'll ask you but I'll, I'll sort of prefix it that so much of what we're describing is the responsibility of an instructor to observe you know and to gauge and to to lead the learning process so is, is that something that you are concerned about, you know, transferring to digital or is it something you think is, is, is feasible? Yeah, I think in a lot of respects, one of the, the hesitations, challenges, if you might say, for digital learning is that feedback loop, is that, you know, whether it's the nodding of the heads, it's the, you know, that kind of what my instructors call the light bulb moment, you know, the aha, they got it moment. And not having that is is one of the, you know, probably from a training provider's perspective, one of the concerns is seeing that feedback loop. And, you know, we've considered a lot about the duration between whether it be a distance learning model or an online model and when they engage in the practicals, exercises, the hands-on activities. Um, even if it's something as simple as, um, you know, giving them an assignment to do with their peers on site to engage with that learning. So it, you know, it takes it from the theory to the concrete uh, realm of their brain so that they have the practical experiences. And then when they come in for a training session, you know, then we can do kind of more of the, you know, audit or evaluation or even taking it to the next level. But um, yeah, that I would just say the effective training is something that goes, you know, kind of from the mind to the hands very quickly. Taylor, again, um, the only training provider that we've had on these these panels. Um, you explained to us earlier that you've been looking at this in some form or another for for a while. Um, but focusing on that core topic of uh, describing effective training, what are your thoughts about what it is and how we can transfer it into a digital setting while keeping that level of quality that the GWO stands? Piggybacking off a little bit what Dan said earlier, my worry is the class interaction because the best classes that I've taught, the best classes that I've been in, the best, best classes that I've observed have been that interaction with guys that have been in the field multiple times with their stories. Um, granted, the good instructors will take some of those stories and feed, do that feedback in that time, but having everybody there while, while taking a class is my probably biggest worry because if, if the best classes like I said, what are the guys that have done this and can tell the story just as easy as an instructor can. So that's probably that that quality that I worry about more than anything. And that's probably the biggest obstacle that we've been facing uh, here for even not in GWO and other classes that we're teaching as well. OK, thanks, Taylor. Um, we'll move on to the next question. These have a, have a bit of a habit of merging into each other. Sometimes the answers that you give do give us a kind of indication of, of this. Um, but everyone knows you have students with different levels at the start of a course. Um, let's begin again with you, Wes. How do you think digital platforms can accommodate the challenge of, of keeping things inclusive? Different I think it's actually really interesting for the fact that, again, I'll go back to uh, the different types of learning out there. Uh, I'd say everyone on this on this call uh, learns from YouTube. Uh, they learn from, uh, you know, Google. Uh, we learn a lot of different things. So the different mediums are out there and and have have been for a while. And and I think the digital, the social media aspect of of, of the world that we live in has changed uh, the learner a bit. And so taking into consideration that there are hands-on people, there are people that learn through lecture, there's people that learn through videos, I think we can choose any of those methodologies and we need to really rely on our, our training providers who are experts in these areas to write curriculum and bring in those different modes and really, really dial that in to understand, make sure we hit all those learning modes so that any of the people who are on those in the trainings are able to relate in some way. Uh, but I think that's it's really important that um, 
we have the, the tools are out there. We can make videos. You can you can have testing. You can have group interaction with Zoom. You there's you can have group discussions. There's a lot of different methodologies, and so it's we just have to learn how to apply it. Mm. Uh, Wes made a really interesting point, which I wouldn't mind asking you, Jacob, just uh, for a moment, is that a uh, little moment where he said it's up to the training provider to decide, and that's really at the core of what PWO standards represent is a, a basis for a training provider to then implement. We've lost your audio, Jacob, you just need to come back in. Yeah, I, I picked up on that as well, and that's re that is really to the core. I mean, it is up to the training provider to provide that right solution. And, and when you said, uh, Simon, that something about it's about the, the professional experience, giving them the, that train as you fight feeling. Um, how do you do that when you have a blended learning, some, something that is more or less maybe standardized in an app, or it could be a virtual classroom? There's a, there's a link between what goes on in the head and the hand. Uh, and, and the practical stuff um, that that is that's up to the training provider to provide those good solutions. I don't know how we could, from a centrally central place, dictate exactly how those that should be. It's just too difficult for us. We don't know all of those technologies, and and even between us, even if we're well educated, we are far behind on, <laughs> on most kinds. I mean, my kids learn from TikTok, and I think a lot of the new uh, technicians out there will learn from uh, apps that we don't even know yet. Uh, methods of engaging with material through the through the internet that we don't even know about yet. So let's keep it open to um, to the professionals to, to develop the learning solutions, and so we can, as a group, define the, the learning objectives. Thanks, Jacob. Simon, any um, thoughts on on this particular topic, keeping things inclusive? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I I go back maybe four or five years when we launched a a interactive induction system for our offshore uh, workers, which when they clicked the link, they, they followed a the video, they answered a few questions, and that gave them a virtual green tick to access the field. Um, a bit naively, we didn't really contemplate the fact that a lot of people have varying skills as far as PCs are concerned. You know, some people really don't use them, some people use them every day. So trying to levelize the playing field to a certain extent, we thought we were going in the right direction. And over time, we have matured this, this technology. But nevertheless, I think the delivery method for me have to be interactive, not one way. There's got to be some form of confirmation, questioning, uh, gaining understanding, to make sure that you know people aren't struggling with the technology or the subject matter. Um, so yeah, the delivery method would have to have the ability to have the trainer qualify or quantify what's going on with the with the trainees essentially. So uh, there is technology out there that can help, no doubt. It takes an awful lot of investment. Um, but it needs to be something that the customer should be always in focus. I think that's my point. Yeah, I think some of the solutions we have seen so far uh, gives the course participant the, the opportunity to repeat uh, repeat uh, topics. If, if they haven't really grasped it, grasped it the first time, they can repeat it and, and do a loop. Whereas uh, others are much faster and maybe more advanced uh, technicians, they can do things faster and get to the point faster. So. So that, that's, that's something that we can do with certain technologies. Uh, and you can't do that if you have a virtual classroom where everyone, unless you, of course, tape it, you could. Um, yeah. This goes to show that training providers should probably make the decisions about what's better to use and not. Um, I'm well, gonna, if I can add to that. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add that. Um, you know, I think one of the things, and this is not necessarily unique to the digital training model, is that is recognizing as uh, training providers, you know, and considering our learners, is learning is not a linear process. It's actually more, it's it's more like you know, stacking Legos and stuff like that, and building upon. And I think with the blended model, we have to appreciate that we have to kind of tackle things from different angles. Um, and so it might be the first time you engage it is in something that's very passive, like a video or an e-learning, but then you engage with that subject then in something more interactive with gamification or something like that, and then you touch it again when you get face-to-face, -face. not saying that you're teaching it three times, but you're engaging with that learning in these different mediums so that it builds upon, because an individual learner reading a book, watching an e-learning can only go so far. 
then you have to say, okay, how can I now take it to the next level in a, in a small group setting or something like that, or in a larger group setting. Uh, and so utilizing those and not, it's a challenge that I see a lot of times in our education model is say, well, I taught them that when they first got hired. So I don't need to teach them again, say an intermediate level training. And that's absolutely not true. That's not how our, our minds work. It's not, you, you, I, you showed it to me two months ago and I never have to see it again. That's, um, we have to kind of appreciate that building model. Hmm. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, before we move on, I just want to encourage um, you, the participants who are listening in, to type in any questions that you have. There's certainly no, no dumb questions. I mean, um, we have a lot of experience online today and um, plenty of uh, knowledge and, and um, hopefully some practical tips as well if this is um, something that's uh, a burning issue at your organization. So please do um, give us your questions and we'll come to them as quick as we can. Um, let's move on to our third question. Um, and this one is sort of along those lines that I just mentioned. Um, this is about offering some practical advice. Um, I'll go to um, Simon, first of all. Do, do you have any reflections here if the training provider is considering developing their own digital solution, what would be your advice as a, as a user? Yeah, I think it's very much as a user. Apologies for the sirens, we're right outside a police station here, so something exciting is going on outside. But um, I, I would start with the with the customer base by canvassing those people you've already had through the door. I think uh, ultimately you are customer focused, you are delivering a service. So I think it's trying to understand um, you know, what, what's the spread out there? Do they need the face-to-face? -face? Do they think you know, a digital environment would be the best thing for them. So understanding how much investment needs to go in the right direction. Um, I, I think then looking towards the available technology and what medium works best for different types of learning. I think we mentioned that before, but I think we, we've had some experience now with these things, these virtual reality. We have a, a new piece of equipment offshore, which is going to be a significant change to the people that used to work in the environment. So by using VR goggles now, we can give them the access on a vessel to the offshore structure. We can show them climbing a ladder and then accessing a new turbine layout. So I think by using that as part of the blended way of, of tuition, I think one is the induction through a VR goggle. The other is the, the basic safety training they will need for the further work they're going to carry out. So I, I think for me, one is, is, is understand the customer base, trying to get exactly what their opinions are blend that into the type of method you want to deliver. Some things will naturally lend themselves towards a virtual reality or, or some sort of technology. Um, others won't. I, I, I really do get a lot of value from putting a harness on, you know, being stood on a ladder and, and, and working hard with, with some lines and, and my colleagues. That you can't replicate. And I think there is a, a, a medium for all things. Thanks, Simon. Um, Taylor, I'll bring you in on this one. Have you perhaps, uh, do you recognize any of those? Suggestions that Simon made, you know, you've gone through that process yourself. Uh, what advice would you give to another training provider? Uh, as soon as you think you have it figured out, you have to redo after you have it implemented. Uh, it, and it's going to be a constant learning process, just as this pandemic has shown us as well. Always evolving, always changing, and doing using the feedback at the end to decide, well, granted, it might not work for one, but does it work for others? And in the tailor, you know, no, no pun intended, but customizing that a little bit to the customer and to the students that are going to be in the class, because no one's going to know better than the company sending people to us if someone is going to be fine in front of a camera. My college age daughter tried it last semester and was not one of those people. Uh, so we have to think of the, the different ways to learn and be able to offer multiple steps and multiple ways, in my opinion. So even offering uh, a, a single customer multiple different ways to access the training in, in one group of participants? Or? And the beauty is, is not everybody is going to be able to have, say, firefighters, EMT on staff to be able to teach the first aid. You know, we can put them in front of those people teaching that module. Then we can put the people that have been in WIN multiple years teaching the working at heights. So there's people that we you need to put in front that are the great teachers or former teachers or former firefighters that are the subject matter experts. Can we can you know customize it that way as well? And then when they come in and do the practicals, hopefully at that point in time there's some continuity and they've all, always picked up what has has gone in in theory as well. 
I, I agree with Simon though. You cannot, there's certain things of this, like putting on a harness, you know, climbing a ladder, uh, climbing 35 feet, climbing a hundred foot that you just cannot do. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dan Vestas, um, what advice would you have for training providers considering their options in this regard? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that might be, I, I definitely agree with what Simon and Taylor have said, but I, I kind of think a bit more from, you know, my organization is very operationally focused a lot like Wes's and, you know, um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with folks that say, sim you know, something simply as, um, well, you teach that in a classroom, you can obviously teach that, you know, remotely or digitally or something like that. And we've found that, you know, it's not one for one. And so, you know, the advice I would give is you really need to sit down with your learning objectives, whether that's through the GWO course, whether that's something that's internal to your organization and start parsing out your learning objectives. And because you can't take like an entire course that say you would normally teach in a classroom and just transfer that wholesale over to a digital model. You literally have to go learning objective by learning objective and make the decision, you know, do I feel okay with this being in a more passive learning environment digitally or, you know, virtually through a classroom or does this next learning objective need to be done in some sort of physical environment? So it takes a lot of time to kind of sort and sift through your learning objectives and then go through the course design process to see how, how can I make this, you know, flow cohesively and actually feel like a course and how long is it and how, you know, do I do it in micro learning modules or something like that? But that would be the first step in my mind. And um, just a, a, a quick reflection because, um, we have a, a good group of attendees here today, but as I said before, we are dealing with a fairly sort of advanced topic and, and many training providers have, have yet to even establish. Um, but perhaps, Wes, this is, this is a bit of a challenging question for you, but if we frame this question, you know, in the context of a training provider who's yet to establish, but you know, perhaps they might be considering uh, jumping over that hurdle and, and going, straight in with a digital learning solution is, is it um is it a relatively straightforward does it not really matter whether you're new to this or i, I think we're all new to it <laughs> <laughs> point. so i think it's 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 just a natural evolution at this point and we have to uh we, I, I really don't think we're jumping in it's it's all the same it's just the flexibility uh comes into play I think from, from my perspective is again go back to the demonstration of competency uh, and just like Dan was saying you know lining up the objectives and I would be lining those up with how I demonstrate competence and say can I deliver can I deliver the content and whatever medium to define competency and, and to observe competency um, and it may not be able to be done except in the physical setting but then there are a lot of these objectives that you can achieve with video interaction, all those types of things. But to me is start with the, the defined competency and say, okay, how do I want to build to get somebody to be able to do that action, whatever that may be. An example, I suppose, would be a learning objective that asks you to uh, demonstrate that you know something back to the instructor. That might be an example where a video link would be efficient. Yeah, we could, we could use an example. I, I'll show you how to don a harness. Well, typically you want to see that, you know, I can watch that on video. I can critique you on video to how to don a harness. I don't have to be face to face to do that. So there's certain ways we can do things. Yeah. And I think we need to overcome some of these just practical examples, perhaps, to, to illustrate the fact that the learning objectives within GWO standards are relatively simple and that they are asking you either to demonstrate that you know something or demonstrate that you can do something um, and then breaking that up into a, a group of uh, objectives which can or, or otherwise need to be done in a physical environment. Okay, um, so our last question is the main one for DWO members I guess. Um, will this trend towards digitalization can help increase the amount of standardized training in North America. It's, it's been growing fast this year, uh, COVID-19 notwithstanding. 56% um, more training in the first half of 2020 without any kind of digital delivery. But could it push things forward even more? Um, Wes, I'll, I'll go to you again. Uh, 
So I'll share a couple of perspectives on this, and I think it does nothing but help at, at this point. And the two two things I'll point out is one, uh, the the cost effectiveness of it uh, comes into play when we're, we're we're not traveling texts to and from uh, training providers as as often. Uh, maybe we can deliver less uh, less travel time, and 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 in conjunction with that, keeping Texas at site, like I said before, is is highly important. You add in the COVID-19 piece of this, and and reducing the risk of spread of virus, those types of things are are, are a benefit. And I think uh, you know the North American market is really looking. We're always looking for you know flexibility in training providers or in training. Um, and I think we have the the, the situation where we have. A lot of um, operators coming on as self-performing operators, and they have the same uh, situations that we have as, as an OEM, where I have to do a contractor management, I have to deal with uh, my own internal training, and the ability to have that flexibility uh, for me to be able to look at a, a contractor when I'm trying to manage contractor performance and be able to say, hey, they've got good training, it's to a standard, uh, that's very easy for me as, as a for me or self-performer to be able to do the same thing rather than having to audit and check every single training program of every subcontractor that works for me. So the ability to have digital training, open up these options, I think really puts, puts us in a better situation for growth in, in the North American market, American market because it's a, it's a trusted training standard and, and we can work together to improve uh, digital training in the US. Uh, Simon at Bristol Duke, do you agree that it helps just actually break down some more of those barriers rather than putting new ones up? I think your microphone's off. Sorry, here we go. Um, yeah, just to repeat the, the the flexibility with the customer, I think, and also the employer. I think we we obviously focus on the big corporations who have a large workforce. Moving those people around is inevitably cost in, inhibitive. But, but also I, I, don't, I have a sympathy towards the, the one and two man bands, you know, the, the guys that are self-employed who lose earnings while they're training. So if we can give them flexibility, if we can give them the ability to take on training when they're not working, I, I think that to me is, is a good way for a take up or an increased take up in training. Um, I think it can only help. Uh, it's just another option to the customer, I think. Um, and as long as we are thinking as customers, uh, making sure that delivery method is professional uh, the technology doesn't get in the way um, it shouldn't hit anybody um, i think it should just complement the training i think as, as we mentioned before some training courses do lend themselves more easily to a virtual environment but others i think still have a, a lot of value being and, and having that interaction uh, with the, rest of the trainees in the classroom um, we, we can talk about cost savings. Obviously, that that's important for our businesses and, and and also for the environment. You know, moving people around significantly, flights, train, accommodation, it all adds to the uh, to the budget. So, it, if there's a reduction around that, then that's absolutely perfect. But I think the the ultimate for me is is making sure that the delivery delivery method gives flexibility to the to the customer. I think that's my last point, really. Thank you, Simon. Um, Taylor, um, at High Plains, you've obviously been building your GWO portfolio for, for five years, been very successful. Do you, do you anticipate digital delivery will um, you know, open new doors for High Plains? Is it um, you know, along the same lines as, as Wes and Simon have just been saying? Another way to, to support the growth of GWO? I think the more ways that you can provide something for employees and for companies, the better that it will grow. So especially in North America, we've already seen it different different industries in high plains before, and we've had to adapt. Um, I think any any different platform that you can provide and then have them come in, like Wes said, with the competencies will definitely help people buy in more, especially when it comes to this market. Um, you know, time is money. Uh, is is a big thing that they say a lot. You know, the one thing is, is we always, we uh, just have to just um, accept it and be able to move on and not always coming to different places. You know, you see the trend of out in the field training goes up and then injuries occur more often. And then all of a sudden you're going to a training center more often. So we just need to uh, see why not try it and see. And I think it'll definitely help the North American market though. Good, thanks, thanks, Taylor. Um, Dan, I'm going to ask this question to you, but again, kind of slightly edit it, just because 
I want to. Um, the <laughs> uh, COVID-19, as Jakob's presentation, resulted in the closure of long periods of hospital and many of the developments that were put in place were designed to bridge that gap between them. So I guess we have to look at this question in that context too. Yeah, um, I feel like, um, yeah, my answer even before you answer the, ask that edited question, which I think is in line with where my answer was going to be, was maybe a little bit more cynical um, because there, I mean, you know, there's supply and demand, right? Um, you know, everybody so far has talked about the demand, and I think that this will definitely decrease uh, or increase the demand side, but it also does from a developer perspective, from a supplier perspective, actually creates an interesting barrier to entry um, where, you know, if you've never done digital training development or um, that's not your expertise as an organization, it's a pretty significant step up, um, especially because, I mean, you know, you look at a lot of the training providers out there. I mean, they are not large organizations. They don't have, you know, deep pocketbooks or significant cash flow. And so that could create a barrier to people coming in as suppliers. And I think, you know, has the potential of kind of creating the, you know, the, like the Walmart model where the, you know, the big players are the only ones that survive. Um, I hope that, you know, there's going to be a, um, training providers that not only create the digital content for their own use, but also look at ways to license it to other providers to utilize because, you know, then they could use that as more of an off the shelf product to then augment with their, you know, face to face learning, whether it be at the service site or at the at their uh, training center. And I think that, you know, if somebody out there has a pretty good, pretty good digital training solution and is willing to license that, I think that could that right there could significantly decrease the, the barrier for suppliers to come in. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Where's any thoughts on on the idea of what about you know a sort of white labeled solution some training provider out there that could deliver no I, I, think, I think it's brilliant because i think and that's that's why we have to rely on the training providers just like we were talking about to deliver a solution and there will be somebody who comes up with a, a great platform and it might meet all the standards very easily and then you just like have to augment with with the uh, competency piece of it but i think uh, it, it really gives a, a an opportunity for some training providers to think creatively and, and say, you know, because so, like you said, some some of this is not going to be your space, but and, you know, and it's the investment that it takes with it. But there are some very smart people out there that will come up with some really unique solutions. Um, before we move on to the final parts, Jakob, any sort of uh, yeah, observations? Yeah, yeah. Just wanted to observe that we have already 41 training providers around the world who are certified to deliver a, a blended learning solution. Some of those specifically for BST app uh, refresher partial, uh, but, but most of them can do any kind of blended learning solutions. And the first ones were from the Baltic countries and delivering training for people everywhere in the world. So the, if the barriers, uh, the travel barriers, you don't have to travel to the Baltics to, to get a training from the Baltic uh, training center. So there, there are some opportunities here and, and even people in uh, South America, North America can get can source training from a digital provider somewhere else. It's about uh, figuring out the time source, I guess. Well, we managed to do that together today, so um, we will move towards our conclusion. Um, I guess we must have asked all of the questions, uh, you know, just right because we've we've not had any in from the attendees so far. But, uh, <laughs> You know, like I said, there is no dumb questions, only some answers. Um, so we'll we'll try and make sure that we um, we give you um, as many good responses as we can. But um, we'll jump straight over to a, a final bit of feedback. Then um, again, it's a trip to our uh, online buddies at menti.com. Code in this case is twenty six zero six eight two seven. Um, I'll put that up on screen so that we can see the final parts of it. This is uh, the audience today comes from both the training and the user community, so and also our panelists as well. So we want to know in general 
either will you be providing digital training or requesting it in, in the near future. The first time we asked this question, it came out, it came out around 75% on the two choices, potentially and definitely yes. So it'll be interesting to, to see what you all think. We're getting some uh, positive responses on, on the right hand side there. Um, <clears throat> But um, while we're, we're on screen, I want to thank uh, the four of our guests today, Wes, Simon, Dan and Taylor for your insights. It's been really, really helpful to hear uh, your perspectives on this today. Um, everybody with a, a slightly different view, uh, different organisations, um, some of you providing training, some of you getting your own training. Uh, there will be a available of this webinar already so we'll make sure that that's available and you can share it around with your organizations um, when the time comes but um, for now while those results show um, well 100% of the responses that are coming in are potentially or definitely yes I suppose there's some semantics between undecided and potentially maybe they're the same thing. Um, but this isn't an exact science um, but hopefully it's given you all an opportunity to um, uh, get your point across and um, if you do have any questions for us uh, after the event then please uh, contact us in the usual way our help desk is always available at info at globalwindsafety.org and the social media channels are always available for you um, so we welcome any and all questions and as we've repeated uh, a number of times the, the, the overall goal is to to encourage the adoption of GWO standards in North America and so I think we've um, clarified from our panel today that um, digitalization is, is merely another means of getting us to, the, to that uh, destination. So uh, once again thank you all for um, participating and we will sign off in a moment um, unless anybody has another burning issue uh, hands firmly on your laps I can see. Um, so. Uh, with that, um, we will sign off and thank you for your participation and uh, have a good day. The rest of the day in North America is good. So. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Many thank thanks. You very much.